All right, we're starting Acts chapter 8 this morning. And uh, if you've ever seen a listing of uh, great chapters of the Bible, I've got, a, I think, probably two or three different lectureship books and uh, just topical books that that's the theme is great chapters of the Bible. Well, Acts chapter 8 is always in there. You know, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 8, you know, Galatians chapter 3. And there's different chapters in the Bible that that fall in that listing of great chapters of the Bible. And Acts chapter 8 is rightfully included in in those. Uh, When we come to Acts chapter 8, this is the beginning of the second major division of our outline on Acts. You see at the top of your, your handout, it starts with that big, bold number two. <laughs> well, the big, bold number one was the church in Jerusalem. Uh, and as this uh, outline is based on Acts chapter one and verse eight, that's what Jesus said, isn't it? That the church would begin in Jerusalem and then it would spread from Jerusalem throughout Judea and Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. So the second major division of, of our outline of Acts Uh, begins in Acts chapter 8. It goes from Acts chapter 8 to Acts chapter 12. The church scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And then under that, uh, there's a smaller breakdown, or or a more detailed breakdown, we we might say, um, that goes to uh, Acts chapters 8 and 9. The church extended geographically, Number one, the disciples scattered abroad, Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. Number two, Philip preaching Christ in Samaria, Acts chapter 8, 5 to 25. Uh, then uh, the subpoints under number two, Philip's confirming signs, verses 5 through 8. The conversion of Simon the sorcerer, verses 9 through 13. And then Peter and John visit Samaria, verses 14 to 25, uh, imparting spiritual gifts, verses 14 to 17, uh, Simon's sin and connection to the apostles, imparting spiritual gifts, verses 18 and 19, and then Peter's rebuke of Simon in verses 20 to 23, and Simon's repentance in verse 24. So not only do we have uh, two tremendous examples of uh, the plan of salvation and, and responding to the preaching of the gospel with the Samaritans in uh, Acts chapter 8, verses uh, 12 and 13, but also of uh, what's typically referred to or what I've heard referred to many times as, uh, well, I'll just ask you all, <laughs> what is Simon used as an example of a lot of times? Right, but there's a term that, that we use a lot of times for that, right? We talk about the, the plan of salvation, and then there's the second, the second law of pardon, right? And we go to Simon as the example for that. So we, we, we have two tremendous examples with the Samaritan uh, Samaritans and the Ethiopian eunuch of obeying the plan of salvation, but we also have in this chapter a very detailed example of uh, what, as, as Frank pointed out, what we refer to as the second law of pardon. The second law of pardon being uh, how someone who has already been baptized into Christ is forgiven when they, when they fall away. You know, that's one of the things that people who try to deny the necessity of baptism, that, that they try to do kind of like the Sadducees tried to argue with Jesus about the resurrection of the dead, and they thought they had him in a logical contradiction with the Levite marriage. Well, a lot of times when you're talking about the necessity of baptism, they'll, people will come back and they'll say something along the lines of, so, so you think after you're baptized, you, you don't sin anymore? And of course, our response to that is, well, sure, we, we sin. We, everybody sins and falls short of the glory of God. And, and then they'll say, so you have to be baptized, you have to be rebaptized every day when you sin. And, and you know, it's, it's this idea that when you're baptized, that you're forgiven of all of your past sins. 
and that's it. But that's not it, is it? <laughs> right? In uh, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, the blood of Christ continues on in, in our life after we're baptized, right? It continually cleanses us of every sin after we're baptized. Well, if we sin and we fall away, how is it that we're restored? Do we have to be baptized again? Well, no. Simon is an example of that. Simon uh, uh, immediately backslid. And when, when we read about Simon going through here, it's very clear that, that Simon reverted back to his former conduct. That's what backsliding means, right? When you, you, you become a child of God, you're supposed to start living a different lifestyle, right? To live a, a, in a different way. And, and when we revert back to our former conduct, that's called backsliding. Uh, well, Simon did that. And Peter told him to pray God to forgive you for this transgression, right? And, 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 and Simon asked for prayers for his forgiveness. Well, that's an example of the second law of pardon. And James uh, talks about that in, in his epistle also. So we, we have that uh, example here in Simon the Sorcerer. Uh, and then Peter and John return to Jerusalem, verse 25. Uh, then there's the example of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch in verses 26 to 39. And then Philip preaches from Azotus to Caesarea, verse 40. I've got a little piece in the bulletin about that last verse, uh, uh, verse 40, where we come to the close of um, Acts chapter 8 with Philip being in Caesarea. It says that he came to Caesarea. We don't read about Philip again until uh, all the way in Acts chapter 21, and he's still in Caesarea. About 20 years later, he's still there in Caesarea. Uh, I have heard some say, not many, because it is kind of a fringe, uh, you know, kind of wacky thing. Uh, there's, you know, some here in LaGrange that kind of have this idea that you're not supposed to have a local preacher. Uh, well, then what do you do with Philip? Because <laughs> he was the local evangelist in Caesarea for 20 years, right? Um, and, and they'll say, well, there's... Uh, there, there's nothing in the New Testament pattern about a localized preacher. Well, that's just not true. Uh, Philip, and, and I use Philip. Philip's not the only uh, example of why that's not true. But since we're in Acts chapter 8, I wanted to include that. So there's a little uh, piece in the bulletin there about that. All right, question 241. Uh, before we read question 241, let's just read the first section of Acts chapter 8. Verses 1 through uh, 4. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles, right? So up to this point, the church had not spread beyond Jerusalem. So all the apostles were still there in Jerusalem. And when the disciples were scattered because of the persecution... It says that the apostles stayed there in Jerusalem. Now, uh, we'll see later that the apostles, you know, did scatter out and did, you know, start going on missionary journeys, we might say, as, as exemplified by Paul. Uh, but at this point, they're still in Jerusalem. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentations over him. As for Saul... He made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. All right. Question 241 says, who is introduced at the stoning of Stephen that would be a leading persecutor of the church? Saul, right? You go back up to... Uh, chapter 7 and verse 57, 
It says, then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now Saul, so the one that was consenting to his death, the one that uh, they laid their clothes at his feet. It says, now Saul was consenting to his death. Uh, of course, we know that this is the one who, in the next chapter, is going to be converted by an appearance of Christ on the road to Damascus uh, and will later become known as the Apostle Paul. And in Paul's writings, he makes reference to the fact that he was a persecutor of the church. L look at what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 9. It's, it's interesting, you know, how Paul expressed his guilt, really, over, uh, over how he had been a persecutor of the church in uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 9, it says, For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because what? I persecuted the church of God. So Christ had made Paul an apostle, right? We'll, we'll, we'll see, you know, where Christ sends uh, Ananias to him, a prophet named Ananias to him, uh, and, and uh, he's told when Ananias says, you know, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> this guy Saul, if I go to him, he's going he's gonna to arrest me and take me back to the council, have me stoned just like they did Stephen. He was afraid to go to Saul. And what did Jesus tell him? He is a chosen vessel of mine, right? So, uh, Jesus made him an apostle, but Paul didn't think that he was worthy to be an apostle. That's why he says, look over at 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. So, uh, you know, when he says there he counted me faithful, Is he talking about he counted me to, as a faithful Christian? Or is that talking about a characteristic of Saul that uh, uh, God found useful, right? Why was he such a zealous persecutor of the church? That's right. Zealous, right? Uh, look over at... Uh, Let's see, I, uh, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 6. Philippians chapter 3 and, and uh, verse 6, he says there, concerning zeal, right? Concerning zeal. Is zeal a positive characteristic for a servant of God? Yeah. I mean, without zeal, you're lukewarm, right? We, we know what, <laughs> how he feels about lukewarmness. Zeal means being on fire. It means boiling over. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. So as he says, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, 
concerning zeal, persecuting the church. So why was he persecuting the church? Because he believed that he was serving God in doing that. He believed that he was doing the right thing by persecuting the church. He was zealous for what he thought was right. He was wrong. He was ignorant of what was right, as he says there in 1 Timothy 1.13. Uh, but that quality of zeal pointed in the right direction was tremendously useful to God, wasn't it? You know, why, why did Paul become the great missionary of the church, carrying the gospel to, to Gentile regions? Uh, under threat of death, even even uh, uh, being stoned for doing it, shipwrecked. And, you know, he goes through all of the things that, that he suffered, and yet he kept going. He kept going. He never let anything stop him. Why? Because he was zealous. That's what zeal looks like. And uh, then in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 13, He says there, For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. So Paul uh, always remembered you know, where he came from. Did he let it hinder it? You know, sometimes, sometimes guilt is debilitating, right? Pe people allow their guilt to to hinder them in in their conduct, right? That that they, like Paul said, uh, that you know he wasn't worthy to be called an apostle. But did he allow that self perceived unworthiness? He he told Timothy that uh, God counted him faithful. And put him in the ministry, but he himself thought he was unworthy of that. Did he allow that to in any way at all hinder him in his service to Christ? No. As contrary, to the contrary, it was a motivator to do even more, right? Because recognizing where he came from, his, his past behavior, his former behavior, how, how he persecuted the church beyond measure, trying to destroy it. It's like he wanted to do that much more to build it up. To, to do more to build it up than he had tried to do to destroy it. And so uh, it, it's interesting to look at how Paul reflects on the fact that he was a persecutor of the church. Uh, how he thought that because he had been a persecutor of the church, he was unworthy to even be called an apostle. Well, are, are any of us really worthy to be called a child of God? I mean, when we really think about the fact that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And, and, and uh, that, that it's by grace that we're saved, right? It's not because we deserve anything. It's not because we, we can be so righteous that we earn the death of Christ on the cross for our sins. We're all unworthy to be called children of God. But he does call us his children. Jesus said, look, look over in uh, Hebrews chapter 2. beginning with verse 10. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them what? Brethren. 
if it, if anybody ever said to me that they were worthy in the sense of deserving it, that they were worthy of the death of Christ, that they were worthy to be called a child of God, I'd have some serious reservations about spending much time with that person, <laughs> right? Now, in another sense, you know, we have been made worthy by the, by the sacrifice of Christ. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it. It's by God's grace that we can be his children. And yet, the Holy Spirit, through the Hebrews writer, expressing the mind of, of uh, Christ here, says he is not ashamed to call them brethren, to call us brethren. He's not ashamed of us. Sometimes we're ashamed of ourselves. Sometimes we should be ashamed of ourselves. That should bring us to repentance and to greater faithfulness. But he's not ashamed. He's not ashamed to call us brethren. He is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. Uh, I, one of the most beautiful uh, exhortations in the Bible he says he's not ashamed to call us his brethren and that he's in the midst of the assembly with us singing praise to God. I, I love that passage. So it, it, it's uh, there's some uh, great value in, in looking at how Paul would later look back on this point in his life and, and what he had done here and how it motivated him to be, you know, as we say, the, you know, the great Apostle Paul, the great missionary of the church, the, the, the writer of two-thirds of the New Testament, right? Uh, so that's interesting, isn't it? That, that two-thirds of the New Testament was written by someone who started out trying to destroy the New Testament church. Number 242, how is the early persecution of the church described? Great, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. You know, it, it amazes me that, and I know I've brought up premillennialism several times in, in, in our study through Acts, and it's because you know, over and over and over again, we're reading things in the in the early church, in the history of the early church, that totally disproves the false doctrine of premillennialism. And and uh, here's here's another one, because premillennialism talks about the great tribulation from from the book of Revelation, the great tribulation, as though it's something that is still to come in the future, the battle of Armageddon as though it is something to, to still come in the future. And yet here, in the early history of the church, we read about the great persecution. What's the difference between a great persecution and a great tribulation? Same thing, isn't it? Same thing. The great tribulation of the church is the rejection of the church throughout the Christian age. How time and time and time and time again... Throughout the entire Christian age, from its very founding to this very day, there's places in the world today where our brothers and sisters are worshiping God under threat of death. If their government catches them worshiping in the name of Jesus, worshiping by the word of God, today, the first day of the week, if they get caught, they can be executed. But they're still doing it. How is that not a great tribulation? How is that not great persecution? It's always been. That's, that's what John is referring to in the book of Revelation. The battle of Armageddon is symbolic for the struggle of the church in the world. But we're victorious. The great tribulation is symbolic for the struggle of the church in the world. But we're victorious. You know, I, I, 
I know we're not studying the book of Revelation right now, but there's, there's some parallel here. Uh, and I always love that story that I hear about the book of Revelation, how, you know, a preacher got up and announced uh, one uh, Sunday that he was going to begin a study of the book of Revelation. And uh, a kid in the congregation came up to him and he said, preacher, I already know what the book of Revelation is all about. And the preacher thought, oh, no, what has this poor kid heard about the book of Revelation? And the kid says, we win. <laughs> and the, preacher's, the preacher laughs and says, you're right. That's what it's all about. It's all about the fact that we win. Right. Uh, and, 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 you know, so. What have we already seen up to this point? Chapters 1 through 7. I mean, when we come into Acts chapter 8, what have we just got through studying about? It's referenced in the paragraph right before this. The first martyr of the church. So the persecution had already gotten so severe that now they were killing Christians. It already said they wanted to kill the apostles, but they were afraid to. They've been beaten, arrested. It's not going to be too much longer after this till we see one of the apostles getting executed and how the Jews are just tickled pink over that. How is that not great tribulation? It says right here, it's a great persecution. So, uh, again, you know, the, the, the things that premillennialism teaches are just contrary to the New Testament pattern. Over and over and over again. And yet, the huge majority of our friends, neighbors, family members in man-made churches believe, if not in totality, like Faith Baptist down here with their judgment journey, they haven't done that in a couple years, I don't think, but that's what judgment journey is all about. They try to scare people to death with, with their depiction of what they believe the book of Revelation is about to try to scare them into being Baptists. They're not scaring them into being Christians. They're scaring them into being premillennialist Baptists. They're, you know, total. They, they, they accept it in totality, the doctrine of premillennialism. But then there's all these other churches around us that accept it to greater or lesser degrees along the spectrum, almost, almost everyone in denominations believes that there's going to be a millennial kingdom on earth in the future. Almost all of them. Whether they accept you know, all of the intricacies of premillennialism, almost all of them believe that. And it's simply not true. Here, the Great Tribulation, it says it almost explicitly. Great persecution. There's no difference between great tribulation, great persecution. They both mean the same thing. It's just a different word for the same thing. And so uh, we certainly need to be able to point them to that and say, well, you know, if the great tribulation hadn't happened yet, then what's this talking about right here where it says great persecution? Right? So... Uh, the the uh, persecution in the early church is described as a great persecution. 243, to where were the disciples scattered? Judea and Samaria, right? So, uh, you know, going back over, and we've, we've said that this is the basis for our outline of the book of Acts. You go back over to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That's Acts chapter 2. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. That's up to Acts chapter 7. And in all Judea and Samaria. Now that's uh, Acts chapters 8 through 12. And to the end of the earth. That's Acts chapter 13 through 28. Right? Uh what, what, what begins in Acts chapter 13? Paul's missionary journeys, going out to the Gentile regions, carrying the gospel. After the, the uh, uh, church is established in Antioch, then uh, the, the uh, uh, mission efforts to the Gentile regions begin from there. Uh, 244. 
Who is accepted from the scattering? The apostles, right? The apostles were, were still in Jerusalem. Now we're going to read here where Peter and John go out from Jerusalem to Samaria, but then they go back to Jerusalem. Um, any questions or comments up to that point? Number 245, how did the disciples react to Stephen's execution? Right. Great lamentation over him. Right? He was the, he was the first one. I mean, they, they see now. I mean, they've, they've already seen the apostles getting arrested. Back to that uh, uh, reference in uh, chapter 5 where... It says that the apostles were preaching in the temple, but the rest dare not approach them. And, and I said there that my opinion is the rest is the, the rest of the church who, you know, let the apostles go do their thing. And they kind of held back, you know, because the apostles kept getting arrested. They got arrested again. Well, That's right. Right. That's right. Yeah. This. I mean, it's 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 absolutely a turning point in the the history of the church, right? Because I mean, they've been targeting the apostles, and the the apostles have been taking the 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 brunt of the persecution up to this point. But now they turn the persecution on the disciples, and and they see, you know, these people want us dead. I mean. Uh, this recent episode in uh, Israel, the October, they, they you know refer to October seven the same way like Steve said we refer to nine eleven. Uh, they refer to October seven, and, and it was just a horrible you know terrorist attack. Thousands of their citizens were were killed uh, in, in that terror attack, and. Um, I forget why I lost my train of thought. I, well, I must. I'm, I, something hit me. I, I was making a point from that, and it, I lost it. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, that's right. I mean that. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, now I remember. <laughs> In response to that, uh, there were, there still are, uh, pro-Palestinian rallies expressing support for the very ones that carried out that attack against Israel. Uh, that would be like, you know, having rallies to support the very ones that flew the planes into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. And tried to go for either the Capitol or the White House. Uh, and I saw a video clip of some Jewish college students that were outside one of these pro-Palestinian rallies on their college campus. And you could hear them chanting their slogan inside the, you know, where they were having the rally. And these Jewish girls were just in hysteric tears talking to the, the uh, I guess, the president of the university. I forget which university it was at. It happened all over the place. But I saw this particular video clip, and, and they were you know, begging this dean of the college, president of the college, whoever, to, to you know, shut down this rally. And, and she was you know, crying hysterically. She's saying, listen to what they're saying. They're chanting. They're saying that they want me dead. They want me dead. Well, that's kind of what's going on with the church here, isn't it? That now the disciples see beyond any shadow of a doubt 
It's crystal clear to the disciples here that these people want us dead. It, it would make them happy for us to all be dead. So you're, you're right. It's definitely, uh, they, they, they realize that, you know, uh, <laughs> they got some struggles ahead, right? Any other questions or comments? 246. What was Saul's activity at this time? Making havoc of the church. Look at look at the severity of what's going on. Entering every house and dragging off men and women. Now think about that. That you, you go home from church this afternoon, from the assembly, right? You, you go home this afternoon and you're sitting in your house eating lunch. And somebody kicks your front door in and drags you off to the county courthouse over here and drags you up before the judge and says, uh, these are some of those uh, Christians over there at the Northside Church of Christ that are worshiping God over there. And the judge says, uh, lock them up. Or worse, because we, uh, as, as we see going through, they killed them, executed them. Had the Romans execute them. Instigated the Romans to increase the severity of the persecution. More than what the Jews themselves were able to do. That's, what, that's what's happening here. You know, you put yourself in their position, I, it's hard for us to even imagine. We, we can't even imagine such as Now, like I said, uh, we do have brothers and sisters in the world today that that is their reality. I, I, I preached in a village uh, in, in India where they had told me, and this was the, the village when I preached there, there was a, a priest of the local Hindu temple that stood in the back of the assembly, shaking his finger at me and yelling at the top of it. I couldn't understand anything he said. He was yelling at the top of his lungs and shaking his finger at me the whole time I was preaching. The louder he yelled, the louder I preached. And the louder I preached, the louder my translator shouted. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and, you know, the translator told me after that, you know, he really appreciated the fact that I didn't stop. Because, you know, they've, they've seen others that, that stopped when that happened. Uh, but I wasn't going to let this guy stop me from preaching the gospel. He, he would have had to have come and physically forced me to stop. And so if he wasn't willing to do that, then I wasn't willing to stop. Uh, but afterwards, I called him up to the front and asked him, you know, what is your issue? And he said, tell these people to pay the temple tax. And I said, I don't have any authority to pay them to tell them to pay the temple tax. Even if I did tell them to pay the temple tax, they wouldn't pay it because it's against our scriptures for us to do that. And he said, OK, and he and he left in that same village. They had gone around while the Christians were at church. It, it, they were assembled together for worship. They went around and put locks on all their houses. So when they went home, they couldn't get in their house. And the police would not make them take it off for three days. These people had to live outdoors because they couldn't get the police to make the people take the locks off their houses. Uh, so we do have brothers and sisters in the world today that are facing this kind of persecution where, you know, they their their reality is that somebody could kick in their door, you know, this afternoon and drag them out. Um, but they're going to worship God anyway. And sometimes I wonder if we would do that. If we have that kind of zeal, that kind of commitment to Christ, that if we knew that the Gestapo could walk in here any minute and round us all up because we're doing something that they deem to be unlawful, if we would do it anyway. Now, we might not do it as openly with a big sign out front saying, hey, here we are, right? Which is the first century church didn't do that. That's where that little what's called a Christian fish came from is that 
that's how they would let others know where they were assembling. They would draw that little fish either on the wall or in the dirt outside the door, you know, so that other Christians would see that. It's like their sign out front. You know, they would see that and they would say, okay, well, this is where my brothers and sisters are, right? Uh, so they didn't advertise it where they were, <laughs> but they still worshiped, even, even at a time when they were being rounded up for persecution and later for execution, explicitly rounded up for execution. So uh, I would like to think that we would still do, we, we would still assemble and worship together the way we're supposed to, even under those circumstances. All right, we'll pick up there, Lord willing, Wednesday night. And I know that there's a lot of questions left, and I'm going to have to really move Wednesday night. So it'd be good if y'all already had them all answered, and I could just ask the question, you give me the answer, and we just keep going. (laughs) 